Hey guys, so I wanted to come to you today and talk to you about something that's very near and dear to my heart, not just because I'm a veterinary professional, but also because I'm a cat mom, and that is euthanasia. We'll go over why it's important, when it's needed, and ways that you can cope. I feel like it's something that is not talked about enough, um, and I think that is because of the feelings and things that stem from what all goes along with that. So... This video is going to be kind of set up a little differently. Um, I'm going to go over some things in regards to euthanizing your cat um, or having to euthanize a foster um, kind of broken down in sections in case you ever want to go back get a specific section or a specific topic. So we know from a human standpoint that euthanizing a human can come in various factors, various ways, right? But what about when it comes to our cats? So there's two main forms of euthanizing a cat. One is gonna be in a private clinic environment. And the second is gonna be more geared towards our shelter cats, our rescue cats, um, our fosters. Um, and that's not to say that like, all foster cats and things like that can't be euthanized in a private setting. Usually we will see shelters um, and rescue groups um, if they are not necessarily partnered with a clinic environment, private clinic environment. We will see them perform this end of life procedure um, at their own facility or on their own terms. So from a private clinic standpoint, um, you know, from my own personal experience currently working in a clinic, there's two types of ways this can happen. One is when um, your vet will make a recommendation. Um, this is going to be more of like a quality of life call on the vet side. Um, I'm very blessed to work with a team of veterinarians who go out of their way to do everything that they can to help ensure that cats have the best quality of life possible. Sometimes despite all of our efforts and everything that we do, it's just, it's not enough. And you know, their bodies can only take so much. Um, so that's where we can see um, a veterinarian recommending um, for the pet to be euthanized. Now, the flip side to that is when the owner specifically makes the request for the pet to be euthanized. Um, now, in some cases, we'll have veterinarians who may deny that request. They may feel that um, it's not conducive to the pet's needs at the time. Um, you know, f for an example, if you can't pay for a procedure um, that is not a life or death type of situation, um, euthanizing your pet is, is not going to be an option. Um, there's there's different ways to go about that um when i worked in the county shelter which is a public shelter um i would have people call all the time and want to euthanize their pet if we could not take their pet in at that specific time so basically what that means they wanted to surrender their pet to the shelter maybe we didn't have space at the time um so we required an appointment and their response was well i just want to put it down that's not that's not a valid reason to euthanize your cat or your dog. Um, so the veterinarian makes the call or the owner makes a request or you have a situation that is an emergency, which we see a lot in the clinic setting where a cat, you know, is not eating um, for an extended amount of time. Um, we see cats who are not breathing or are having trouble breathing, very labored breathing, heavy breathing, um, vomiting, just different things like that um, that will prompt an owner to bring the cat in on an emergency type of situation. So at this point, it now becomes kind of an extreme situation because you see there's something wrong with your pet all of a sudden. And so you rush them into the clinic um, only to be told minutes later that, you know, there's not really much that they can do. Um, 
and it's recommended to euthanize the cat. So the flip side is going to be the shelter environment where, you know, for those of us who work in rescue or have fostered or have been inside those walls, you know firsthand that it's not an easy decision to make, but it is a decision that is made fairly often. Um, I remember when I first got hired at um, DeKalb County Animal Shelter, you know, I was amazed that Lifeline had made this shelter a no-kill clinic because I knew DeKalb County Animal Control when it was euthanizing animals on a regular basis, on a daily basis, throughout the day. Um, so that's the flip side. Um, but... I think for me, what I've learned is that regardless of what end of the spectrum it's on, it, it never gets easier. It never gets easier. You know, you take a foster mom who's fostering kittens and she's losing those kittens one at a time for whatever reason, you know, those kittens are dying. It's something that is naturally occurring where let's say the kitten is not going to make it or doesn't make it. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make it any less potent when it's a direct decision that has to be made. So those are kind of two ends of the spectrum when it comes to um, a euthanizing factor. So now let's talk about quality of life, right? Or, or quality of life in care. Um, so quality of life is... Well, there's two ways you can look at it. Some people look at quality of life like, oh, well, my cat's still eating, he's still drinking water, you know, he's, he's still got some life in him. Um, usually, what I've heard is from a lot of cat parents is that, you know, when their cat stopped eating, it's kind of how they knew it was time. And that's not always the case, right? We know that Cats are very good at hiding pain. They're extremely good at hiding pain. Extremely good at hiding illness and sickness. So while on the outside, they may still be doing everything normal in their routine, on the inside, it could be totally different. So what are some things we can look at? Well, there is something called the feline quality of life chart. Now, obviously, you can do this on your own, but this is something that you want to pair with um, a veterinarian. This was started by a woman named Alice Villalobos. She is actually um, a doctor of veterinary medicine. She has been practicing for over 20 years. She actually started something called Pospice, which is essentially like hospice um, services for cats. And... She started, she created this chart called the Feline Quality of Life Chart. It's essentially just a chart and it has different questions that you can answer kind of like on a scale. And so when you get done with this, it kind of helps you determine like what category your cat falls into. So that's something that you can look at um, on your own time, you know, in the privacy of your own personal space. So the third thing that I want to talk about is saying goodbye during COVID. So at the gate, we already know that COVID has mm, put a lot of wear and tear on us. Um, emotionally, mentally, physically, financially, all the things, all these things are just continuing to kind of move in this sphere of chaos. But then we lose our pet on top of that. The one constant in our lives, and we lose our pet. So a lot of clinics um, and a lot of companies that do like in-home services um, for end of life, they have now implemented a lot of restrictive measures. The clinic that I work at personally, um, we don't allow clients in the building not in the, not in reception, not at all. 
um, unless they are saying goodbye to a pet. That is the only time that we allow um, clients inside the building currently during the time of COVID. Um, obviously, we take all protective measures um, and then we will put them in a private exam room and go from there. Um, but some clinics, unfortunately, that's just not an option for them. Um, and so essentially clients are having to bring their cat to the vet and drop their cat off. Now we have had situations where owners don't want to be present at all. And I know some of you are thinking like, how could you not be there to say goodbye? You have to keep in mind that everyone grieves differently. Every situation is not going to be the same. Um, and for some people, it's just too painful for them. You know, I'm not going to speak on a negative aspect where, um, you know, the, maybe it's just not a nice owner. That We won't even get into that. But what we will focus on is for some people, it's just too difficult. It's too painful to say goodbye. Um, so what about in-home care? So there are a lot of companies that have private euthanizing services where you can have them come to your house and you can your pet can be um, safely handled in the comfort of their own home. So again, every situation is different. With COVID, it depends on the company and how they're choosing to handle that situation. I personally think that with everything going on at this time, if you can find a clinic that is allowing clients in for this type of service, um, then that is something that you can you should look into. However, um, let's say you have a cat that just really can't be moved or, or something where it's just, it's not feasible for you to take them into a clinic. Then you can look into private services at home. Shelter and rescue staff, fosters, volunteers, um, cat ward employees, kitten ward employees, um, all of the people that work in a rescue type environment. So we all know about compassion fatigue. We know how serious compassion fatigue gets. Um, I have personally lost numerous people that are close to me um, in the veterinary rescue world from techs to doctors um, to admin staff that work in the shelter environment, all, all sorts of things. Um, it is so important to take care of yourself. It is imperative to take care of yourself. Um, the day-to-day -day stress of rescue life, whether it's TNR, whether it's fostering, whether it's you're volunteering, whatever it is that you're doing, or whether that's your regular job, um, it can be overwhelming and unbearable at times. I've gone home many, many nights sobbing just from the day, this one day. Not talking about the day before or the day after, but this one particular day and everything kind of piles on. Um, I encourage those of you who are working or volunteering in an environment like this to seek some form of counseling, some form of therapy. There's no shame in it at all. I personally have spoken to a therapist and I have gotten counseling for my compassion fatigue um, because at one point for me, it really became a struggle. And one of the biggest things that I struggled with was when animals had to be put down. Um, usually in like a shelter environment, depending on how it's laid out and designed, everybody tends to have a hand in that. Um, when I was an owner surrender counselor, they would come to me and ask me to provide them with a list of surrendered pets. So these are pets that came from homes. These are cats that came from homes um, that I felt comfortable enough to put on that list to be euthanized. 
and that was difficult for me that was a struggle for me that was something that I um you know no one wants to do that no one wants to be the person to No one wants to be that person that is going to take this harmless, innocent being and write their name on a list for them to be euthanized. And my reluctancy to do so, my defiance, um, just added to an already stressful situation. Um, but, you know, when we think of no-kill shelters, and this just kind of piggybacks on all of that, when we think of no-kill shelters, you know, a lot of people are misinformed when it comes to no-kill. No-kill does not mean no-kill at all. A no-kill shelter is essentially a shelter that falls within a certain guideline right so they have certain percentages that they meet when it comes to no kill um rehoming or i'm sorry reuniting um pets with their owners um and then you factor in like adoption rates and things like that so would it be amazing to have tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of shelter environments that are not killing pets at all absolutely of course it would but the reality of the situation is there are some shelters who just perform these services a lot less compared to others which essentially is a step in the right direction um whew, sorry so for owners, for you at home, or, or client, uh, uh, shelter staff, rescue staff, um, or private owners, wh whoever you may be watching this video. So I have five tips that have helped me through grieving the loss of a pet, the loss of a foster, or, you know, the loss of one of my favorite cats in the shelter environment. One, feeling guilty is a normal response. It is absolutely okay to feel guilty. It is absolutely okay to feel like maybe you didn't do enough. But I want you to know that you did do enough. Um, sometimes these are just things that we can't control. But feeling guilty, feeling helpless, those are all things that are normal. And those things are okay for you to feel. Feeling angry, feeling pissed off. That's okay to feel too. Everybody agrees differently. So what the process is for someone over here is not gonna be the same process for someone over there or the same process for you. So it is okay to sit in your emotions for a little bit and to be sad. You just have to know that there's more to life and while this is a heartbreaking and devastating piece of that puzzle of life you're amazing you have friends you have family that love you you have to live for your pets you have to continue on for your pets so that's my biggest like number one tip is to understand that how you feel or how you're currently feeling is okay. That's fine. Two. Again, grieving is different for everybody. So your spouse may grieve a lot less than you may grieve. Or your spouse may not show as much emotion as you may show. Or your children may not show as much emotion 
as you may show or your spouse may show. Everyone grieves differently and that's okay. That's okay. It's no reason to get upset with someone because maybe they're not sitting, you know, in a corner sobbing and bawling their eyes out. Everyone, that does not mean that they are hurting any less. That could mean that they are just trying to do their best and take it a day at a time. So it's important to remember that. Expression and how people see things and how people react to things is never going to be the same. Identically, identical from an identical standpoint, it's not going to be the same. Um, and that it's okay if you lose your cat and then maybe a few days later you catch yourself laughing over pizza with friends or over, you know, ice cream with friends it's okay it's okay to smile and be positive because those happy thoughts those happy behaviors are going to help you get through that difficult time pet loss support groups it is so important to find like-minded people who are going through and by like-minded i mean people who are going through the loss of a pet um especially the loss of a cat because I feel like cats are just so misunderstood already so when you lose a cat you know and someone's just like well it's just you know it's not just a cat like this is my child like this is my heart so I think that pet loss support groups are imperative um that camaraderie to be able to exchange that dialogue can be extremely helpful you can jump on to Facebook and find one, you know, and if you're feeling sad at one o'clock in the morning, jump on and, and reach out and see if someone is up and available to talk. Sometimes talking is just therapy within itself. So I really love um, pet loss support groups. I think they're great. Um, and, you know, if that's just if that's not something that you want to do, if you're a more private person, journal write your thoughts down um write positive happy memories that you have about your cat um memorials you can make a small memorial in the backyard keepsakes necklaces little figurines you know to kind of keep their energy around those are all all good things the next thing don't hastily go and get another cat um i think it's outstanding and amazing to foster i think that i also think it's amazing and outstanding to get another cat but i also feel that sometimes people jump into you know situations where they adopt a cat or they they you know are fostering or they decide to foster and they're not mentally and emotionally in a position to dedicate to another animal um i do think that going up to a shelter or a rescue or you know nonprofit organizations that work with cats and volunteering some of your time while you're going through the healing process i think that that is really beneficial because it allows you to kind of divert your attention into helping those cats that are in need and that's not to say that you know, that is the case for everyone where they can't just go out, you know, the next day and adopt a cat. But I've just seen personally working in a shelter environment that people who tend to jump out and adopt a cat or to, you know, they bring a, a cat into their life right after losing one, it becomes a battle well you know this cat you know my old cat did this or my old cat did that or my old cat really liked chicken treats i don't know why this cat doesn't like chicken treats or my old cat did that you know that's not fair not only is it not fair to the new cat but it's not fair to yourself so i think it's important to heal as much as you can so that way you can fully give a cat who needs that full amount of love in your whole heart your whole heart my last tip 
my last tip is probably the most one of the most important things to me and that is to make sure that you are checking in on your other pets especially if it's another cat so if you have more than one cat and you lose one of your cats i can guarantee you that your other cats are going to be affected by it um even with lenny and steeny when i take one of them like i'll take one of them with me to work to the doctors or something like that for an appointment or an exam or whatever i will watch the other one on the camera and you know i've seen steen like literally sit by the door waiting for his brother i mean eventually he'll start playing and stuff like that but their interaction when they come back together is just so like i can't even tell you so i definitely think that animals grieve i definitely think that animals have emotions and they go through a grieving process almost like we do so it's imperative to check in on your other cats or your other pets um you know some cats will tend to stop eating um some will kind of pine or meow a lot for that companion so you know use your grieving as a way to kind of like flip it where you invest you know that extra time that you have or if you start to feel sad you know get your other cat and, and play with your other cat or invest time and energy into your other cat because they're grieving just like you are and i think it's important for us to remember that animals feel loss and i think it's important that we do what we can to help them get through the situation just like we would need to get through the situation um that's all i have guys i didn't want this video to be too long but i kind of wanted to touch base on something that i felt like is not talked about enough um and i mean you are always welcome to come back and watch this video um look for tips look for hints clues things that can help you um i definitely if you are going through a loss or grieving you have my heart um and it's something that we can get through together um i've lost a pet before and i wrote them a letter i wrote them a letter you know just different things that everybody is different every individual is different but um i appreciate you guys so much for watching and We'll talk soon.